Hello and welcome to the weekly examiner debrief. In today's debrief, we will look at one of the flight tests uh, from this week, uh, and it will be a PPL flight test. Unfortunately, it was not a successful flight test. The nature of these videos is such that the most interesting flight tests to debrief and to learn from and to see what not to do, unfortunately, the less successful ones. And you will see more of those. It does not mean that the indicative number of the general success to failure ratio. And in a successful flight test, it's easy to say, okay, great job, couple of small things, but you passed today, congratulations, uh, go party. It's uh, not that much the case uh, in an unsuccessful flight test and a failed flight test. And we have more things to talk about. So. For this reason, you will see more uh, debriefs uh, in this, uh, more of the videos on non-successful flight tests. But again, it's not a reason to worry. It's an opportunity to learn from. So I typically do my debriefs in a chronological order. So uh, starting with the ground portion, the candidate presented uh, only... Uh, two out of six GFAs. Even though the two GFAs may cover the time for which uh, the trip is planned for, often enough we want to have a big picture in uh, the weather briefing and have the forecast and the overview of what might be the return trip looking like, or maybe there is some weather that is expected later in the uh, time frame that we are flying and that you know, thunderstorms may come up earlier or something may, may move uh, in earlier than expected. So it is important to have an overview of all six GFAs instead of only two. Make sure you do highlight the relevant weather for the trip, for the time of the trip. Having the entire TAF uh, there printed, it's good, but uh, make it easy for you to find the information that is exactly relevant to your trip. Another advantage, you are actually allowed to get some help in the preparation of the ground portion and you can totally have your full package prepared and have an instructor having a quick look over it before you step into the ground portion. And I very much encourage candidates to do so. If they have questions, they can still ask those until the moment the flight test begins. So if you have your weather highlighted and prepared, th there's maybe even something you can still discuss with your instructor before you commence the flight test. Um, another uh, mistake made by the candidate was asking, um, when I asked about the uh, METARs, if it was ASL or AGL for the altitudes, the METARs are always above ground because METARs are always relevant to the specific airport. So like on the GFAs, all the altitudes are ASL because it covers vast area and it's impossible to say specific ground altitudes unless noted otherwise because the ground level is very different, especially here in BC in the mountains. The METARs are always airport elevation, airport specific, so they will be always above ground. That makes it also your mass easier when you're figuring out how much you can actually climb. Otherwise, a METAR saying that clouds are 500 and the airport elevation is 3000, ASL that would not even be possible. So keep that in mind. Another common question, uh, it wasn't asked uh, on this one today, but uh, the common question is, uh, are the headings uh, magnetic or true? And you need to know that generally speaking, everything spoken like uh, uh, the 80s or the directions the tower is giving you for the current winds would be always uh, magnetic. So to match your compass, you don't have to do the conversion, but anything written um, like on your maps, metars, tafts, uh, everything written will be uh, always uh, in true. So you will need to convert into whatever you actually see in the airplane is magnetic. Um, make sure you do know the symbols on the map. Uh, one of the mistakes that was made on this ground portion is that saying that an airport that is actually paved was grass. You are allowed to use the legend of the map and look it up if you are not sure. And it's special to look up. 
and give me a correct answer, then try to do it from your memory and give me an incorrect answer, like a common cash creek across a strip, for, a strip, for example. Um, uh, make sure you do review special VFR procedures. Uh, if the weather is coming down more than expected, uh, if uh, it deteriorates, uh, special VFR in certain circumstances is your option and it's a safer procedure than descending low altitude in uncontrolled airspace or without anybody looking over you without communication and trying to stay in poor weather in the mountain low and close to the ground that's a recipe for disaster so asking for special vfr know the conditions know the restrictions and use it whenever you need to use it that's your uh, safety net your safety backup um, all the weight and balances uh, when we talk about the weight and balance, it's not enough to just calculate the numbers. It is important to plot the numbers on the diagram to confirm that we indeed are within the uh, C of G limits. And it's also important to uh, see if the, we are in utility category, if we are doing the upper air work for the aircraft where we have normal and utility category. So make sure you do have the uh, weight and balance plotted for your takeoff, for your landing weight, and for the zero fuel weight. It's all uh, important for every leg to have all those three. Uh, for the flight portion of this flight test, uh, uh, I observed something that I really, really, really I'm not comfortable is seeing a dragging approach. So uh, in our airport in Big Meadows, we have puppy lights uh, that guide your power on approach to have two red, two white. If you are a single engine, you should be able to glide to the runway if your engine quits. So that means you're ready for a power off approach. That means that will be even steeper. Now, if you're single engine and on the approach, uh, most of the approach, most of the time on final, I'm seeing four red on puppies. I am not comfortable. It's not the place to be. And especially if at the same time you're losing eight knots where, where the tolerance is minus five plus 10. So losing eight knots on approach and dragging approach low close to the ground makes me really, really uncomfortable. Uh, usually on the flight test, we do one circuit first and then we depart for our navigation exercise uh, that gives us a backup if the circuit might not be available in the beginning. We will try to do it at the end of the flight test. So on the Android portion, uh, we did, uh, the candidate did all the calculations according to the nav log. Unfortunately, at no point of that flight test, uh, we I have seen the candidate using the map. The navigation exercise is about navigation and finding uh, your way using the map and other navigation means, but it is working with the map. So at no point we confirmed we were actually on our track prepared on the map within drift lines, making any drift corrections and really uh, having your map stowed away on the navigation exercise is not a recipe of having this um, exercise more successful. The instrument work was uh, not too bad. Upper air work was okay. Uh, then we went uh, into a forced approach. So a uh, forced approach is an exercise that has two components to it. One is the cockpit management and the other one is control of the approach. Uh, cockpit management uh, of the candidate was uh, uh, pretty good, but uh, there were a couple of issues on the approach itself. So the purpose is making the field, obviously. So if the purpose is not achieved, the exercise is automatically not successful. In this case, the candidate actually did make the field, but there were two things. One is the engine warm up. We're doing a simulated forced approach and we want to make sure it doesn't turn into a real one. So we are uh, cl uh, clearing the engine every 500 feet of descent, more or less. So if um, the candidate isn't doing it and the examiner has no choice but to 
do it to prevent uh, the actual engine failure. Um, it's already not a good sign, but uh, also something that uh, really killed this approach is uh, losing 15 knots of airspeed. Again, the tolerance is minus 5 plus 10, and do, going on the low side three times the tolerance is an automatic one on the approach on, on this axis, on this part of the exercise. Uh, next exercise was the precautionary landing, simulated precautionary. Uh, generally speaking, was not too bad, but something I really don't like seeing is uh, on the low pass, inspecting the field to have the aircraft descend. You're better off even training the aircraft for a slight climb, but the um, rationale behind is if you're looking outside, you're inspecting the field, and you're going fairly low and not at a high speed, it's a potential to descend and there might be an obstacle in front of you and you wouldn't even notice it because you are busy inspecting the field. So a slight climb is uh, better than a descent on this one, just pay attention to it. Uh, also, make sure you do not extend or attempt to extend flaps without checking the flap speed if uh, you do it on your aircraft. Uh, something that did contribute to the failure on this uh, flight test uh, would be the uh, use of the checklist on any emergency. So automatically, any emergency you have, you do what you need to do, but always, always, always uh, uh, do double check with the checklist at the end of uh, any emergency. If you don't, even if you do everything perfectly, it will be an automatic two. And as you know, with the new rules, uh, uh, you cannot uh, have more than uh, uh, five twos or five ones and twos uh, for the uh, for, uh, for the flight test. Otherwise, it will be a full fail. The last one is the soft field approach, uh, soft field landing, and at the very end uh, of the flight test, again, it was another dragging approach, unfortunately. Uh, touchdown was hard, and it resulted in a bounce. Uh, so that is uh, not not the kind of landing we are looking at on the flight test. Um, so those are the contributing factors that made this flight test not successful. Uh, I hope that uh, that would be a learning opportunities for uh, both students preparing for a PPL flight test and instructors working with the students. And that video would help you to be more successful on uh, your flight test. Thank you for watching and remember to subscribe to the channel.